Thank you, David and iMedics, for this kind invitation. Um, let's see if I can get this thing to work. Yeah, yeah. That, that, was pain, that was painful, by the way, guys. Penn doesn't make it easy. Uh, not as bad as Chaffetz's plays Harvard, but it's still bad. So given that our ability to predict response to individual agents is still quite limited, um, I decided to break this topic up into the three questions that were sort of interposed within it. What factors influence choice of first therapy? How can we be smarter? And how can we predict response? By the way, uh, I've been drinking some smart water, which comes from New York, and it actually doesn't make you any smarter, just so you guys know. That's, that's New York for you. Nothing about New York makes anyone smarter. Uh, so what factors influence choice of first therapy? So there are a number of things that I think about uh, with my patients every day. So the disease severity, the devil you know, safety, efficacy, data gaps, and associated conditions. So first and foremost, disease severity really determines what categorization of medication people are going to get, i.e., immune suppressive versus non-immune suppressive. So, uh, and that's often the biggest mental hurdle for both docs and patients to overcome. So by disease, with Crohn's disease, remember, not all patients need uh, treatment. There's, there are some lucky few out there that don't require any treatment, either because they have very mild disease or because they're post-operative. Some patients who have their first resection or their nth resection may not need therapy ever again for reasons that are unclear to us or might not need therapy for years and years to come. Patients with mild disease might be able to be treated with uh, budesonide every now and then, with or without 5-ASA if they have colonic disease. And those with moderate to severe disease would almost always require treatment with immunosuppressive medication. For ulcerative colitis, even today, half of patients can still be treated with 5-ASA alone, which is really wonderful, although those with more severe disease will need immunosuppressives in most cases. So the devil you know, I always love this phrase. Um, so patients and physicians are generally risk averse. I know I am. Uh, we all like drugs with which we have experience. Thus, new drugs represent uncertainty and are li less likely to be used. And every now and then, there's really good reasons for this because sometimes really terrible and unexpected things happen with drugs that we don't have much experience with, like PML with natalizumab or uh, hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma with combination therapy. Even with thiopurines, it probably took us a, a few decades to truly realize all the risks of these medications in, in detail. So. You're always more comfortable, both, both from a safety standpoint, but also from a uh, efficacy standpoint, with drugs that you have a lot of experience with. Um, <clears throat> when we think about safety, there's not a lot of comparative safety data for the biologics, and I'll be focusing a lot of this talk today on biologic therapy. Um, but we do have a lot of uh, safety data in IBD on biologics is, um, is, is on infection. So in the treat registry, we learned that the infliximab use was associated with an increased risk of serious infection. A recent uh, pooled analysis of vetalizumab randomized control trials and their open labels extension showed that vetalizumab had a lower risk of infection than placebo. And in fact, the confidence intervals, if you see here, didn't overlap, um, which means that this difference is highly significant. And there was numerically lower risk of upper and lower respiratory tract infections. From the SOLAR registry, which looked at safety of uh, ustekinumab and psoriasis, they found that the use of ustekinumab was associated with lower risk of overall infections than infliximab or adalimumab. And in fact, the confidence intervals there also did not overlap, so this is highly significant, with a numerically lower risk of pneumonia. So these drugs overall are very safe, and we shouldn't be afraid to use them. Now, how about comparative effectiveness? Well, unfortunately, there's no randomized or good prospective observational comparative effectiveness data for different classes of biologics. Um, from the randomized trials, we do know that anti-TNF therapy, vetalizumab, ustekinumab, and tofacitinib all seem to have reasonable efficacy for the indications tested. In fact, the only randomized comparative effectiveness data we do have in Crohn's disease is the SONIC trial, which we're all very familiar with, in which combination therapy was associated with better response rates than either monotherapy with infliximab or azathioprine, and infliximab had better response rates than azathioprine. Similarly, in UC, in a study that was Shorter and terminated early, the UC Success study, they found similar uh, observations with combination therapy and infliximab versus azathioprine monotherapy. So say you choose to use uh, a certain TNF, that you, you want to use anti-TNF therapy for someone. Well, how do you choose between the drugs? Well, unfortunately, again, there's no randomized or good prospective observational comparative effectiveness data for the various um, agents we have. So 
This is a study we did a few years ago with Jim Lewis and myself and a few other colleagues from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, where we looked at comparing users of infliximab to adalimumab and Crohn's disease, <clears throat> and we found that the rates of persistence on drug without the need for steroids or surgery at weeks 26 or 52 were similar, as were the rates of hospitalization, as were the rates of surgery, although in patients less than 65, infliximab use was associated with a lower risk of surgery. How about for ulcerative colitis? Again, no randomized or good prospective observational data to compare the different agents. But what I find most compelling, actually, is to look at the clinical trial data themselves here, as these studies were designed similarly for these three drugs. And I tried, although it's never epidemiologically valid to compare across trials, what I try to do here is to level the playing field as much as possible by looking at only anti-TNF naive patients at standard dosing of drugs. And I looked at delta versus placebo, so the difference from placebo as opposed to the absolute response rates, to try to account for differences in patient population. And what you can see that induction, this is an induction slide right here presented, the IV uh, weight-based drug seems to outperform the two sub-Q non-weight-based drugs for induction and similarly for maintenance. Now, how about data gaps? So fistulizing disease, only infliximab has randomized controlled trial data, two trials actually, uh, with fistula as a primary endpoint. There's some data for other anti-TNF drugs and limited data for vetalizumab or ustekinumab. How about severe hospitalized UC? We have good data for infliximab and cyclosporin. Also, we have a little bit of data for, infl uh, for accelerated dosing of, of infliximab in this setting with fecal loss and things like that that lead to, uh, to that kind of thing. Uh, but it hasn't been really been studied for other anti-TNF therapy or vetalizumab or topacitinib. And finally, when we're thinking about choosing a first therapy, associated conditions matter because IBD is not just a gut disease. People have immune dysfunction, and that relates to other, translates to other areas of their body. So for those patients that have a predominant arthritic or RA component, I would consider using anti-TNF in those patients or potentially tofacitinib once it gets FDA approved with or without methotrexate as co-therapy. For ankylosing spondylitis, our rheumatology colleagues tell us that there's really nothing like anti-TNF therapy for the treatment of this condition. And for those who have a predominant psoriasis component, I'll consider using uh, ustekinumab or anti-TNF therapy first line and potentially co-therapy with methotrexate as well. So let's move to the second condition, uh, second question, how can we be smarter? Well, four ideas immediately pop to mind. One is treat active IBD. Second is early combined immunosuppressive therapy. Third is three, treat to target. And finally, my favorite of all, and Adam's favorite, therapeutic drug monitoring. So treat active IBD. While this sounds relatively obvious and per perhaps even silly to discuss, I just want to point out that it really isn't. So Sonic is probably our best trial in Crohn's disease to date still. It's, it's, our, it's our mothership. And in Sonic, 20% of patients did not have active mucosal disease. Another 20% had unknown mucosal disease, either because their endoscopy was not done or their video was inconclusive. And as a result, not, not surprisingly, if you just look at patients who have some kind of objective evidence of uh, active disease, whether uh, endoscopic lesions or elevated CRP, you see the response rates increase and the differences for both combo and infliximab monotherapy versus azathioprine increase. The Afif paper, which is often quoted for reactive therapeutic dr drug monitoring, sort of the Bill Sanborn experience of how he does drug levels, 62%, 62% of patients with loss of response, quote unquote, to infliximab, despite therapeutic infliximab levels, had no evidence of active disease on endoscopy or radiology. And why might that be? Well, remember that a lot of other diseases can mimic the symptoms of IBD, including infection, and especially our friends C. diff and CMV, bile salt diarrhea, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and irritable bowel syndrome. So, it turns out immunosuppressive therapies, you know, doesn't really work very well in these other conditions. So the second way we can be uh, smarter is to use early combined immunosuppressive therapy. This is the landmark top-down versus step-up study published uh, almost 10 years ago now in Lancet, in which they showed superior outcomes at both one year and two years with the use of early combined therapy. A more recent study of early combined immunosuppressive therapy in Crohn's disease is REACT. This was a large cluster randomization st uh, study of nearly 2,000 patients from 41 community practices, mostly in Canada, but also in Belgium, <clears throat> in which they took patients uh, for the early combined arm versus conventional management. But the early combined arm, if they didn't, if after four, we after four to 12 weeks after using corticosteroids, if they weren't in remission, they had, went on combination adalimumab and immunomodulator. And what they found is that after two years, 
there were significantly lower rates of surgery, serious complication, and a combined outcome of hospitalization, surgery, or complication, and numerically lower rates of hospital admission with users of uh, early combined therapy versus conventional management. So now we start thinking about potentially changing the natural history of the disease. And why would we want to do that? Well, let's remind ourselves what is the natural history of Crohn's disease. This is maybe one of the most important slides, I think, in the last 15 years in inflammatory bowel disease, and it was published in the IBD Journal. And what it shows is that over time, when treated to symptoms alone, Crohn's disease will progress in almost 90% of patients. This is a progressive disease. So it's, it would be good to change the natural history. And along those lines comes the concept of treat to target. So the results of the first treat to target study in an inflammatory bowel disease, which happened to be in Crohn's disease called CALM, was presented at this year's DDW. And what the authors there did, they took patients and randomized them to either treat, get conventional management, or treat to target where they treated based on clinical symptoms and CRP and or fecal calprotectin. And what they found was that patients who were treated with a treat to target strategy, this was early disease, but at 48 weeks, had uh, significantly higher rates of endoscopic remission as shown by CDEIS less than four and no deep ulcers. Deep remission, which also included clinical remission, no corticosteroids for eight weeks and no fistula, and biological remission than those patients receiving conventional management. So now it comes to our last idea of how to be smarter, and this is my personal favorite of all, TDM and therapeutic drug monitoring. Adam will be talking a lot more about this topic in detail, but I know many of you are familiar with this topic, but I want you to think about TDM in two kind of new ways. The first is something that we like to call optimized monotherapy, which I know I and Adam and Marla Dubinsky have been practicing for a number of years now. And finally, we have some data to substantiate that we're not crazy. So this is a post hoc analysis from Sonic in which the authors asked a really important question. Why did combination therapy work better? Was it an independent effect of azathioprine or was it azathioprine's PK, you know, pharmacokinetic effect on infliximab? So what they did was they took at week 30 infliximab trough concentration quartiles and looked at how patients did irrespective of treatment group. And what they found was that the response was all based on the quartile they were in, and there was no difference between the two groups if you, took, if you took them by quartile itself. Now, given that, patients with combination therapy had higher infliximab levels, and they had uh, a higher proportion of them with higher infliximab levels, but you can achieve potentially the same things by just giving more infliximab and not using a second agent. And why would you potentially want to use uh, optimized monotherapy? Well, because um, we and others have shown that the azathioprine, aside from corticosteroids, is probably our riskiest drug, and it would be nice to avoid that if possible. So on the left, this is a pooled analysis of six adalimumab clinical trials that we did, and we showed an anywhere between a three and four-fold increased risk of either can all, all cancers excluding non-melanoma skin cancer or non-melanoma skin cancer alone. And on the right, this is a pooled Medicare Medicaid database we analyzed to look at non-candidal, so i.e. more sort of clinically important opportunistic infections, two-thirds of which were due to herpes zoster's, and we found that patients who were treated with combination therapy had higher risks of opportunistic infections than those treated with anti-TNF monotherapy. So there are advantages of doing optimized monotherapy. The second way I'd like to have you think about TDM is proactively. You know, you don't wait for the stoplight to go up after a teenager dies in a car accident. You like to sort of prevent things. We like to prevent problems, not to cause. And you don't wait to check TAC levels on your liver transplant patient after they've, uh, you know, rejected their organs. So I always like to think proactively. And I know TACSIT has been sort of billed as a negative study, but it's really not. Remember, in TACSIT, all patients, and so Adam will probably show you the slides in detail, but all patients were optimized initially. So everyone got TDM up front. And by doing that, Significantly more patients with Crohn's disease achieved clinical remission, so it wasn't a negative study. Only after that were then patients randomized to continue TDM or no TDM, and then only followed up to a year, which isn't long enough to really see a difference, and then there was no difference uh, statistically between the groups. Adam and I pooled our data from our two centers, and a large population, we had 264 patients treated either reactively, about half of them, or proactively, the other half. And we, what we found was that, because a lot of patients People, and there's some guidelines saying that maybe if you do TDM, you should do it reactively, but we don't believe that's the best scenario. So what we found that was that substantially and highly significantly more patients who are treated reactively have less treatment failure, IBD-related hospitalization or surgery, and antibody formation to infliximab, and this is uh, in press right now in CGH. So 
my, my, my own belief is that if you think the drug levels are useful, you should just check them proactively. So the third question, how can we predict response? So I look at this sort of in two ways. One is how do we predict severe disease, and then how do we predict response to our biologics? So these are many clinical factors that you're very familiar with in Crohn's disease, which have been associated with severe disease progression. Young age, perianal disease, penetrating disease, upper GI, terminal ileal, ileocolonic location, presence of severe endoscopic lesions, smoking, and need for initial treatment with corticosteroids. Well, genetics are also potentially useful. So having one NOD2 mutation increases patients' risk of stricturing, fistulizing, overall complicated disease, or need for surgery. And if you have two or more mutations, this is a meta-analysis of 49 studies led by Peter Higgins and his group in the University of Michigan. It was 98% or more specific uh, for a complicated disease, so these are probably patients that should be treated more aggressively. Marla Dubinsky in the Cedar cyanide uh, group with Steph Targan have taught us that using serologies can also be helpful to predict disease progression. So they looked at in Crohn's disease, ASCA, OMPC, and CBR1, and the presence of any of these was associated with a higher risk of internal penetrating, stricturing, or surgical disease. And actually having more, a higher number of antibodies and having a higher titer of antibodies in the bottom right, the quartile sum score, was also predictive of more aggressive disease down the line. So kind of putting it all together, this is a recent web-based tool developed by Corey Siegel and Marla Dubinsky and Mark Silverberg from Mount Sinai in Toronto, in which they took a number of these clinical and serologic and genetic factors and put it together in a predictive model that gives patients a gra graphical representation over three years of what their risk of developing a complication is going to look like. It isn't always linear, it can be sort of a more of a geometric kind of curve, and it's very useful for patients, and it has about a 70% predictive ability. So this is sort of a nice tool for patients. So how about predicting response for biologics? So for me, most importantly, it's been shown that for anti-TNF therapy, vetalizumab, and ustekinumab, higher inflammatory burden and lower serum albumin lead to higher clearance of drug and therefore lower response. So these drugs thus are likely underdosed for some patients, especially during active disease and especially during induction, which then creates an opportunity for dose optimization which is the basis of a study that I helped design called Interpret, where we're taking patients with ulcerative colitis treated with vetalizumab, and those who are non-responders at week six with a high clearance at week five will have the chance to be randomized to receive much, much higher dose intensification of their drug. So I'm lo very looking forward to that. It started enrolling a few months ago. So now let's talk about predicting response to individual biologic drugs. And unfortunately, for anti-TNF therapy, we don't have really good uh, predictive tools available. So this is a recent, uh, some recent data from James Lord's lab that was presented at this year's DDW, in which they were able to predict response to vetalizumab by looking at baseline um, expression of alpha-4, beta-7 in CD4 cells, CD8-positive T cells, B cells, and NK cells. And for all those cell types, patients who were responders had higher expression of alpha-4, beta-7 than non-responders. And then not surprisingly, if they looked after treatment, there was a higher uh, receptor alpha-4 beta-7 receptor saturation, i.e. less free alpha-4 beta-7 uh, in those cell lines among responders and non-responders. So that's sort of really cool, I think. Sort of along these same lines, etralizumab, which is a subcutaneous uh, anti-beta-7 drug, so it blocks both alpha-4 beta-7 and alpha-E beta-7, which binds e, e cadherin and keeps intraepithelial lymphocytes within that compartment. What they found was that and they biopsied everyone, essentially, almost everybody at baseline, uh, did the colon biopsies, and they looked at gene expression of alpha-E and also the number of alpha-E positive cells. And they found that in patients who had higher gene expression or alpha-E positivity as far as number of cells at baseline, they were more likely to respond to therapy, and especially in the etralizumab 100 milligram group and in, and, and in anti-TNF naive patients. Extending this observation in the same data set, they also looked at granzyme A gene expression at baseline. Granzyme A is a serine protease that's expressed in activated uh, T cells, NK cells, and NK T cells. And what they found is that patients with higher baseline expression of granzyme A had higher response to etralizumab, again, both in the 100 milligram group and in patients who are anti-TNF naive. So really, we're, we're finally, I think, moving towards the concept of personalized medicine in the future and sort of like the holy grail in IBD, sort of the first holy grail in IBD coming up. So I think the future is very exciting for us, and I'll conclude my talk with that. Thank you. <laughs>